Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. This week marks the 150th anniversary of one of the bloodiest massacres in the city of Los Angeles history. On October 24th, 1871, at least 18 Chinese people were killed by an angry mob. 15 of the people were killed, were hanged, and three were shot. It coincides in time with other mob attacks against the Chinese throughout America, many such attacks driving people out of their own neighborhoods. Today we're going to be in conversation about this history. My guest is Michael Wu. Michael Wu is an urban planner and was the first Asian American elected to Los Angeles City Council. He represents third generation of his family involved in Los Angeles Chinese community. He is the co-chair of a steering committee that has produced a report that came out last Friday on the recommendations of a memorial remembering the massacre. He is also the author of an essay called After 150 Years, Is L.A. Ready to Remember the Chinese Massacre? You could find that essay at zocalopublicsquare.org. And finally, he is a narrator in a new documentary film about this story. It's called Buried History. He joins me over Zoom. Michael Wu, it is my very good pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um Talk to me about Los Angeles, 1871, uh, before the actual massacre occurred. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't be a far stretch to say a very different city in 1871 than, than we'd recognize today. L.A. in 1871 was utterly different than the global metropolis that we're accustomed to today. Uh, the population was only about 5,700 it was really a Wild West town. In fact, one historian has written that it was considered the most lawless town west of Santa Fe. Uh, and there was a small population of Chinese, about, about uh, 170 or so Chinese were living there, um, uh, mostly concentrated around a street that was then called Calle de los Negros, named after dark-skinned uh, uh, settlers of Spanish origin who had shown up there. But, but the area where the Chinese were living was considered to be the worst part of town. That is, there were bars, brothels, gambling, uh, uh, opium. Uh, it was a really bad part of town, and it happened to be where most of the Chinese lived. So Los Angeles was utterly different then than now. But uh, one thing that is unusual about such a small town is that even in 1871, there was an interesting mix of ethnic groups. Uh, that is, there were Germans, Italians, French. Uh, there were the original Spanish and then Mexican settlers, as well as this small uh, community of Chinese that definitely stood out to me, as you said, sort of unusual for a small town to be as diverse as Los Angeles was. And again, in 1871, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, Los Angeles, we are talking about it as a small town, just over uh, 5000 uh, residents. Can, can you tell me more about why, why? How is it that the Chinese and Los Angeles ended up in this per, uh, specific neighborhood and street Calle de los Negros? Well, um, I think that it's fair to assume that the reason why the Chinese ended up there were, was because uh, due to it being a bad part of town, rents were probably lower than elsewhere. The Chinese were not owners. In fact, it wasn't even legal for them to own property. So they had to rent. Uh, many of the Chinese at that time were living in other people's homes. In other words, working as uh, house servants or houseboys. Others, um, others uh, owned businesses like Chinese laundries. Some of them worked as cooks. Uh, but most were working in fairly menial jobs that white people didn't want to work in. Um, we think that at least some of the Chinese who were in L.A. in 1871 may have come down from Northern California after working in the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, a very high percentage of the railroad construction workers were Chinese, many of them working extremely arduous and dangerous jobs. But after that was finished in 1869, we think that probably some of them ended up down in Los Angeles. We do know that the former railroad workers scattered across the West after those railroad jobs went away. So 
after the uh, after the railroad was finished, after perhaps much of the gold had been mined, then the Chinese community begins to branch out. I guess throughout the the rest of the country. That's right. By by this time, you're you're right. Uh, the, most of the mines had closed down. The mines were the other source of jobs, other than railroads, that some of the early Chinese workers took. And to give your your audience a little a little bit more background. Most of these Chinese immigrants were men. Most of them were single Chinese men who came over here in the hope of making some money. But it wasn't just that they were pulled by the attraction of the gold rush. They were also pushed to some extent because back in China in those days, conditions were really terrible. Uh, there was widespread famine, especially in southern China, where most of the immigrants came from. There was a lot of social disorder. Like I know from the first time I visited China when I was younger, hearing these incredible stories about bandits roaming the countryside, you know, stealing from people. And so, in other words, it was a really bad situation in China. So the combination of, of, of um, young men leaving on their own to try to make money in America and send it back, as well as probably some some of them were under the illusion that they would strike it rich and discover gold. And while well, some probably did, but for most of them, it was a really hard life. And especially on the railroads, uh, uh, as I was saying, many of them worked the toughest jobs, dynamiting tunnels, and the railroad companies didn't even keep good records of who died or how many died along the way. So it was a very rough livelihood, but it took money to go home. And so it, it wasn't really a practical option for, for these Chinese men to go home. So many of them basically were stranded in America and had to find some way to make a living. And we're guessing that at least some of the Chinese who ended up in Los Angeles probably were in that category. We also know, just like the, with the Transcontinental Railroad, a lot of the Chinese, uh, a lot of the workers who built the first railroad line connecting San Francisco and L.A. were Chinese. And uh, that included, apparently, a very dangerous uh, dynamiting job going through the mountains around the grapevine, you know, where this this deep subterranean tunnel was built. But probably that railroad line connecting San Francisco and L.A. was a very big, a very big strategic move connecting Northern California and Southern California, which, as I was saying, at that time consisted of these dinky towns compared to San Francisco, which was by far the massive metropolis of the West. But this helped to make California a great state. And interesting to think about the connection of San Francisco's Chinese to Los Angeles's Chinese. Yes, uh, uh, I'm sure that, you know, since San Francisco was the main entryway for the Chinese immigrants coming in, that a lot of the immigrants uh, came there, came through San Francisco on their way to the gold mines uh, and, and on their way to the Transcontinental Railroad. But uh, uh, I'm sure that Los Angeles, which, you know, almost nobody had heard of since it was just a small town, uh, was not considered a major destination. That's interesting. Yet these and I guess we get a, in 1871 that we have about 172 Chinese residents there. So they, they found it. They, I guess maybe because it was small, they, they went there seeking opportunity. Well, that that explanation makes a lot of sense to me like generations later uh my 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 parents and grandparents didn't come to los angeles until until like around the 1940s although well actually my grandfather and my dad as a my father as a baby actually came over uh uh, uh earlier uh like more like the 19 tens or 1920s but then went back to china uh but i remember asking my own father how is it that you ended up here in los angeles and not in the bay area where you know even though i was born and raised in la i went to college at berkeley and santa cruz and i wondered why they why it would have been more convenient if the family had ended up there and my father answered me very clearly saying that they came to los angeles because it was smaller than 
than San Francisco and therefore represented better opportunity. In other words, they thought maybe they had better chances of making a living where they were, it was a smaller city and fewer Chinese than trying to compete in San Francisco. Again, the topic of our conversation is the massacre that occurred in 1871. We're really marking the 150th anniversary of the massacre that happened on uh, October 24th, 1871. Tell me, tell me about that day, October 24th, 1871. As I was saying earlier, Calle de los Negros was the, the worst part of a really bad town. It was very common for a man on the street to carry a knife or even a gun. And there was a lot of violence and mayhem. Uh, one newspaper back in the 1870s described Calle de los Negros saying that uh, there were so many murders that, uh, that Calle de los Negros served up a dead man every day. That may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it was a really bad part of town. So if you picture that, then on October 24th, 1871, there was a gunfight that broke out between two Chinese gunmen from two rival gangs or factions in Chinatown. Uh, there is a kind of fate history that alleges that it was a quarrel over a woman, uh, a Chinese woman, but we don't really know for sure a lot of what was going on there. Anyway, around 5.30 in the afternoon, a gunfight broke out. And uh, in the midst of the gunfight going on, two other men ended up getting shot. One of them was a police officer. The other was a white man who owned a ranch and had been a bar owner. Uh, the second man who was shot, uh, Robert Thompson, ended up dying of his wounds about two hours later. So if you imagine a Wild West town without telephones, without television, without the internet, word spread out across the town that the Chinese were killing white people. And so as a result of this, an angry mob that ended up consisting of about 500 people, in other words, about one out of 10 Angelinos converged on Calle de los Negros. And that resulted in violence against the Chinese. In other words, the vigilantes were looking for people who looked Chinese to wreak havoc upon. And that's when violence broke out along Calle de los Negros in terms of members of the mob literally shooting into, firing guns into a, an old building called the Coronel Adobe, uh, uh, named after uh, early settlers who later produced uh, a future mayor of Los Angeles and a future uh, treasurer of the state of California. Anyway, into the Coronel Adobe, there were, it, there were Chinese living there, and the mob started to attack the building, killing some Chinese. According to the historians, neither of the two gunmen were, both of the two gunmen were gone by then. In other words, nobody directly involved in the gunfight was either killed or detained, but innocent Chinese who were not involved in the gunfight, but who happened to look Chinese, these were the people who were killed. So, members of the mob started to put nooses around the necks of some Chinese and drag them away several blocks. We know of three locations in the existing LA Civic Center where Chinese were hanged. Some of them were shot and hanged. Uh, one location for the, your, your listeners who know the downtown area, uh, was around the existing Los Angeles Mall across from the existing federal building on Los Angeles Street. Another location was about three blocks away on Temple Street, ironically outside or near the building today called the Hall of Justice. And so it's, it's very strange to think that with these buildings that today symbolize law and order, that there were actually these vigilante killings that went on. Um, the, the, the violence went on for about three or four hours on the night of October 24th. And uh, we, we've been learning that in addition to this vigilante justice, there, there were also some things 
that were a little more hopeful. That is, we've heard stories that uh, there were actually some citizens who offered sanctuary to Chinese who were trying to escape from the violent mob. Um, uh, there was, there, for example, there was Slaney's Boot and Shoe Shop that was, as it sounds like, a shoe, a shoe store where the owner uh, uh, literally brought Chinese into his business that night to keep them from the mob. We also heard that some Chinese ran as far as a mile away from the point of origin of the massacre and ended up at a vineyard owned by the Justice of the Peace, William H. Gray, who sheltered some Chinese in his cellar. But you can imagine what could it have been like on a dark night running a mile away from a mob and, and knocking on a door, probably unsure of whether what kind of reception would you get from the person there. We also heard that for years after the massacre, um, Justice of the Peace Gray would receive these anonymous token gifts from Chinese thanking him for saving some people's lives. So, as you can hear, this story of the massacre turned out, it unfolded across multiple sites across downtown LA, uh, and that in addition to to the, the, the bitter story about the people who were actually killed, there actually are some other things that we want to be able to highlight in a memorial about some people at least trying to do the right thing. So uh, this suggests that if we create a memorial to the massacre, it, prob it probably would not fit to just have uh, a, a conventional statue on top of a pedestal. And in fact, over the last 30 or 40 years, there's actually been quite an evolution in thinking in America about what is the right way to create a physical memorial or a monument to past tragedies, starting with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. that was uh, completed in the early 1980s. So uh, I may be getting ahead of us on this story, but uh, anyway, this gives you a sense of the complexity of the story, the fact that there are multiple facets, and then it becomes a kind of a creative challenge as to what should we do now, 150 years later, in terms of looking back and how do we illustrate the lessons that should be learned from this episode. A lot to talk about there. Uh, just to clarify, Calle de los Negros no longer exists. That's right. What happened in the 1870s after the massacre is that the story of the massacre became an extreme embarrassment for Los Angeles. There were articles in newspapers in the East Coast that basically portrayed this little town, Los Angeles, uh, as being responsible for this incredibly barbaric act. And, uh, and it made L.A. look bad. And so probably part of the reason why... Um, Calle de los Negros was eliminated, literally obliterated from the map and merged into a new street called Los Angeles Street, is that the city fathers at the time probably wanted to cover it up or they wanted to get people to stop thinking about it. Uh, in addition, as I, as I said, it was a really bad part of town with, you know, all sorts of vice and, and violence taking place there. So maybe it was an early... Uh, it, maybe it was an 18th century version of urban renewal in terms of getting rid of unpleasant memories, but also it, it served to uh, encourage people to forget about the massacre. Uh, and, and so I think this is part of the reason why many years later, um, virtually no one in Los Angeles, even among the Chinese Americans, uh, ever talked about this. I, I think part of it also was uh, sometimes among the Chinese, there's a tendency to not want to bring up bad news and, and, uh, and not rehash the past if people think it's not going to do any good anyway. It's just going to make people feel bad. So I think that was a factor. But also uh, the, the history of violence was not something that Los Angeles wanted to play up because it was, it had been, it was such a, natu a national embarrassment. Uh, for a small city. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Michael Wu about the massacre of 
some 18 Chinese people in 1871. October 24th, 1871. This week marks the 150th anniversary of that massacre. Michael Wu is an urban planner and was the first Asian American elected to Los Angeles City Council. He represents third generation of his family involved in L.A. Chinese community. He is the co-chair of a steering committee that produced a report, came out last Friday, on the recommendations of a memorial remembering the massacre. He's the author of an essay, that you can find at ZocaloPublicSquare.org called After 150 Years, Is L.A. Ready to Remember the Chinese Massacre? He's also the narrator of a new documentary film that you can find about the massacre on YouTube called Buried History. Michael Wu, you, you write in the essay for ZocaloPublicSquare.org that you grew up in Los Angeles, lived almost all your life in Los Angeles, and not until fairly recently did you even know this story. That's right. I had never heard anything about it until 2012 when I was invited to write a review of uh, Scott Zesch's book, The Chinatown War, which is the definitive account of the history of the massacre. But I'd never heard anything about it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that my parents or grandparents may have heard something about it, but they never mentioned anything about it to my sisters or me. Uh, I never heard about it in school. It wasn't written about in any history books. So it just was not part of my awareness of L.A. And so that's why when I finally did hear about it just nine years ago, it was so shocking to realize that something like this could happen in Los Angeles. And then the double shock is that I'd never heard of it. Nobody had ever heard of it. And, and the, only, the only recognition of it is a small bronze plaque uh, set into the sidewalk on North Los Angeles Street, uh, which is fairly inconspicuous. So, so the net effect is nobody had ever heard about it. I was born and spent much of my childhood in a small town called Antioch, which is out, outskirts of the Bay Area here. And I had never heard about what would happen five years later in Antioch. And I never even knew we had a Chinatown uh, in Antioch, but we did. And in 1876, there was a Chinatown sort of near the Delta. And the people there were attacked and, and driven out by the white people of, of Antioch. Uh, the allegation was that there were brothels there and a couple of white men ended up getting um, a sexually transmitted disease. And that was their pretext for attacking and driving out this community that for the law, I never knew was there. I think most people in the area never knew was there or, or, or knew that story uh, until about 10 years ago. I, I wrote a, read a book by Gene Pfizer. I think it's called Driven Out. It's about a history of um, the persecution of Chinese Americans in this country. And it starts off with that story and i was absolutely in shock when when i read yes, it and, and and she actually is the source of a statistic that between the gold rush and and the end of the 19th century there were about 200 forced expulsions of chinese in california basically the same story that you just told about antioch was repeated in a lot of other places including larger cities like fresno pasadena and Riverside. Uh, and and I, I've read about some really uh, horrible incidents, uh, uh, a forced march in Tacoma, Washington, where a mob forced the Chinese to uh, march through, through, through the rain uh, to get to a train station, basically forced to leave town. Uh, and, then, and then the existing Tacoma Chinatown was burned down for four days with no response from the fire department. So in Tacoma, like in some of these other towns, it's not surprising people wouldn't have heard of it because no physical traces were left. And in Antioch, now since, in fact, recently, uh, the Antioch city government finally addressed it and has talked about it. Los Angeles Times, not too long ago, did a story on it, a, a very, very good story on it. Um, so more people are now learning about it. But what, another thing I did not under, know until the LA Times story was even before the actual attacks occurred, there were basically, I guess we call them sundown town. It was a sundown town for Chinese Americans. The, the Chinese in Antioch actually built underground tunnels because they weren't allowed to travel outside their homes at night. 
Yes, I've heard about this also in some other towns, but I've never actually seen them. But uh, uh, this potentially could be a really interesting opportunity for California State Parks or other uh, historic preservation authorities to do something, because there might be some interesting physical relics left behind in, in whatever rem remains of those tunnels. Something to preserve and, and, that's and right. to remember. I like, yeah, I think that's important to think about. Um, what, but what, what's happening in the 1870s? Why are we having these spate of attacks occurring all across the country? Well, um, in some ways, like contemporary America, um, economics was a, is a major source of racial tension. In those days, although the earliest Chinese settlers were actually welcomed as a source of labor, uh, before too long, uh, the Chinese started to be looked at as competitors within the job market. And uh, 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 white workers were encouraged to think that the Chinese were competing with them for jobs. In some cases, the Chinese worked for lower wages. And so uh, uh, white workers then viewed the Chinese as having the negative effect of forcing their, their own wages down just by competition in the job market. So this was echoed by politicians, newspapers, leaders of labor unions, uh, some of whom were became well known in the 1870s and 1880s for demanding that the Chinese must go. And, um, and so that's what was going on. And in addition to the story you told about Antioch, uh, there was a lot of violence that took place, uh, in some cases in the form of forced expulsions, in other cases, actual violence. Um, some people say, have, some people have said that the the 1871 massacre in Los Angeles was the worst violence anywhere against Chinese in U.S. history. But actually, uh, the records show that the violence was even worse in 1885 uh, in Rock Springs, Wyoming, where white miners attacked Chinese miners. Again, based on that same economic competition, the white miners were mad about the Chinese miners working for lower wages. And that led to 28 Chinese uh, miners being killed in Wyoming. Uh, so it's just a sad history leading up to the adoption of the Chinese Exclusion Act that literally made it illegal for uh, Chinese to emigrate to the U.S. Important point. This all leads into the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act. The, the Chinese right. Exclusion Act comes after a lot of these attacks had already occurred. Right. How, how was it treated by the press? Let's, I get, let's go back to Los Angeles. How was it treated by the press in uh, Los Angeles? At that time in Los Angeles, there, I believe, were two or three separate newspapers. Uh, two of them were uh, very anti-Chinese in their editorial attitudes, but one newspaper actually criticized the massacre. Uh, so, in other words, in Los Angeles, at least, there was some division of opinion reflected in the newspapers. Uh, uh, but across the West, where the Chinese were located and, and were victims of violence, uh, uh, the, the local newspapers, many of them were, you know, egged on the crowd, were basically just encouraged the violence and, or endorsed the call for the Chinese to be forced to leave. Do you think we could say the newspapers were the instigators of a lot of, of, of this violence? Were, were they fanning the flames, or was it uh, anyone in particular it, or a group of people? It's hard to say whether, you know, whether the newspapers were the cause or the effect, uh, because I think that politicians had a lot to do with it. Basically, it was, it was uh, 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 a way to curry favor with, with voters who... Uh, had reason to be upset about something, I mean, which is not an alien idea today, certainly in American politics. I think the same dynamics applied back then. And, uh, I mean, frankly, uh, the labor unions of the day back in the 1870s and 1880s also stoked it for obvious reasons in terms of most of their members were white men. And, uh, and it was, and, and so, so, so criticizing the Chinese 
became a rallying cry. So, so I, I hesitant to single out the newspapers, although they certainly played a role in spreading the word and and reinforcing attitudes that were already created by others. I do want to ask you about the record that we have of the 1871 massacre in Los Angeles. I was interested. You piqued my interest earlier. You've been piquing my interest the entire interview. Earlier, my interest was also piqued when you when you mentioned that the gunfight that occurred uh, in La Calle de los Negros, you know, may have been over a, a woman, though it wasn't clear. What it was is that do we have do we have oral stories that come from this period of time? Is it all Rick written records? What what's the record like when it comes to this story? I'm not sure of the exact source, but there are some um, there there are some current accounts that is in, in 2021 that have said that the origin of the gunfight was a uh, Chinese woman. Um, one account says she was a prostitute, uh, I'm not sure, uh, who, quote, belonged to, unquote, uh, the leader of one Chinese faction or gang being uh, stolen away by another uh, uh, Chinese man in another, uh, in another gang. And that the gunfight involved uh, was basically a kind of a proxy war between the two factions, but instigated by what happened to this Chinese woman being uh, taken away by a rival gang. Um, I think there is there is an account that actually gives her name, but other than that, I don't think much is much else is known about it, and I'm not sure what exact source there is. For this story, uh, it may have been, it may have actually appeared in an English language newspaper as a so, uh, as as the source of the story. But that's about as much as we know. Um, uh, and uh, I don't. To me, in 2021, I feel a little reluctant to um, uh, set the story down in concrete. In part because I don't completely trust the newspapers of that day. And because none of the sources are around to verify it, but it does it does give a kind of a colorful embellishment on what could have led to the gunfight starting out. And and how about the record overall concerning the massacre on October twenty fourth, eighteen seventy one? What what records do we have uh, of that story? Uh, there are some records that are pretty clear. That is, we do have the names of 18 men who were killed during the massacre. Uh, but there is some ambiguity or confusion in terms of the overall number. Uh, you will find some articles or books that will say there were not 18 killed. Some say 19 because there was another Chinese man who died several days later possibly in connection with something that happened on October 24th. But uh, the definitive source, which is the book, The Chinatown War by Scott Zesch, who, who did extremely thorough research of the available records, he sticks by 18. Um, there are also books and articles that say 23, or in other words, in some cases, the numbers are larger, but we don't have these additional names and um, uh, it's possible that the numbers are larger than 18, but we don't know for sure. There were some reporters who wrote for the 1871 newspapers who recorded some of the events. So we do know about the location of uh, the three sites where hangings took place. In some cases, the reporters add even more detail. Uh, for example, uh, there is an article that quotes members of the mob encouraging looting of Chinese stores by saying, um, uh, in other words, an article that quotes uh, uh, rioters saying, go get them, boys, quote, unquote. In other words, encouraging people to uh, take things out of the Chinese businesses. Um, and, and so I'm guessing that those newspaper accounts were pretty accurate. Uh, but there are some details lost to history 
that we just will probably never be able to totally confirm. One one story, for example, that I would really love to be able to uh, document uh, is there is there is an account quoted by Scott Zesch who says there was a place on Main Street where up to fifty Chinese were sheltered from the mob, uh, but we don't have the exact address and we don't know exactly. Uh, who did it or where it happened? Because at the other places we know about Slaney's Boot and and Shoe Stop Shop and Justice of the Peace Gray's Vineyard, we know that it was more like a, a handful of Chinese who were fortunate enough to be taken in that night. But it's really on a whole different order to think that there were up to fifty Chinese sheltered in one place. <coughs> it would be great to recognize that. But I'm not, again, we don't have the details, and we may not have a good way to figure out where that happened. So there are some facts, there are some details that I think we can be fairly confident about, but some parts of the story are just lost in the fog of history. You write this in the essay concerning the massacre, quote, Some Chinese refused to go down quietly. Business owner Wing Chung demanded that the city council pay $6,530 in restitution for his losses on the night of the massacre. After the city council failed to respond, he sued the city. The next year, after the city council levied a new license tax, 14 of 15 Chinese laundrymen refused to pay. What what happened after the massacre? Uh that's a complicated story, but let me try to give you the simple version of it. Um, sometimes I know that I have had a tendency and other Chinese Americans have had a tendency to say that the story was, was silenced and <coughs> that people stopped talking about it. But uh, actually, there are a few cases of business owners who insisted on restitution or in the case of the laundrymen, refused to pay a new tax because they were angry about the lack of, of settling scores after the looting on the night of October 24th. Um, for the community at large, there was a process that began with a private recognition, for example, Taoist rituals to honor the dead that evolved over a number of years into a more public event, in some ways trying to reconcile with non-Chinese in Los Angeles. For example, um, there were events that included um, almost celebratory events like a dragon parade, where a a Chinese dragon paraded through non-Chinese parts of town, or where non-Chinese were invited to come to the the old Chinatown to witness uh, the burning of incense or the traditional ways of honoring <coughs> honoring the dead. In other words, it appears to be a some conscious effort on the part of the surviving Chinese community to get beyond the ethnic stereotypes of Chinese as looking funny, wearing funny clothes. Uh, uh, eating exotic foods, smelling different, or even comprising a threat to the public safety in the form of sanitation standards, and trying to do outreach to their neighbors, trying to say, we're not that strange, we're not that exotic, uh, um, and, and that and that there's a rhyme and reason to the customs and the traditions that the community lives by. So, this is something that started to happen in the years after the massacre. And uh, from the perspective of the 21st century, to me, it looks like an effort on the part of the community to say both uh, we're here and we're going to stay here and we're going to be part of this community and part of this city. So we're making this effort to explain ourselves to you and we're welcoming you in. That's very interesting to me. So it seems to be that there's this evolution of a specific Taoist funeral practice that came out of Los Angeles, that came out of these events? Well, well, it, it, it wasn't only Los Angeles. That is, the Taoist ritual of honoring the dead uh, is, is a 
is a really ancient Chinese tradition, and in its most elaborate forms, it includes things like the burning of incense, the uh, the uh, uh, setting of paper boats that represent prayers on bodies of water. I, I, I've seen writings that said that during these uh, these Taoist rituals that are called uh, Jiao. Um, uh, senior Taoist priests would be brought in from San Francisco to come down to L.A. In other words, just like a, a church today where sometimes church dignitaries from far away are brought in to reinforce the significance of some ritual. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, Taoist priests from San Francisco were brought down to L.A. to officiate over a, a rite like this. And that this started, this started in terms of recognizing the, the dead, um, uh, holding um, ritual events at the old city cemetery where the bodies of the victims of the massacre were temporarily buried before uh, money could be raised to send their bodies back to China to fulfill the Chinese custom that it's much better to be buried in your homeland than in a strange country. So there were these initially quite private Taoist rituals that were limited to the Chinese community. But over a period of years, when this ritual was was repeated every three years, uh, uh, it they gradually became more public, and they gradually became an occasion for uh, for inviting in non-Chinese to learn something about Chinese customs. Now, other things like Chinese, the, the Dragon Parade, I, I'm not, uh, this did not originate in Los Angeles, but uh, uh, other communities like San Francisco had Dragon Parades as well. But the, the mood of a Dragon Parade is very different uh, than, than the mood of a more solemn, uh, you know, f- funeral-like uh, ritual. And it, I think it, to me, it sort of signals a different kind of approach, a different kind of explanation of what is being Chinese all about. Uh, in other words, the community, the Chinese community was trying to present itself in a different way. Is the Chinese dragon parade, is, is there anything, is there something about it that's unique to Chinese Americans? Uh, no, not completely. I mean, at least the symbolism of the dragon is well recognized in China itself. Um, but I think that the Chinatown parades featuring dragons uh, has taken on a whole character. Well, not just in the United States, but you know, across the the wide Chinese diaspora. Uh, not all of your audience may be aware that there's a very large population of Chinese uh, emigres who settled across the Pacific Rim, including Southeast Asia, <laughs> Indonesia, uh, even parts of Latin America, uh, the U.S. and Canada, <clears throat> and that uh, these, these immigrant communities have found different ways, in some cases involving dragon parades, in some cases celebrations involving food, uh, or, or other ways of uh, becoming a celebration of Chinese uh, and Chinese culture. So uh, I think that that the tradition of dragon parades has become very common wherever these these uh, Chinese communities exist. But that there's special significance to it uh, uh, in a place like Los Angeles, where we know that the, the early dragon parades were an outgrowth of the Taoist rituals that initially were a very private recognition and and commemoration of the Chinese who were killed in a massacre. That's something different than, I would say, dragon parades in other cities. Michael Wu, your your family has a long long history in Los Angeles' Chinatown. Um, In the recent year, we have seen a 76% increase of attacks against the Asian American community in Los Angeles. I live right next to Oakland's Chinatown. We've also seen a very dramatic rise in attacks uh, against Asian Americans, especially 
elderly uh, Asian Americans. You do write in your essay, you, you see a connection to what we have. Things seem to have slowed down a little bit here in, in, in where I live. Uh, I don't know what's happening nationally. Um, but you do write that you, you, you see a connection between what we've been experiencing recently to this history going back to the 1870s. It's not hard to see a connection. Over the last couple of years, as COVID-19 has become a big problem, the, the tendency in national political discourse to refer to the China virus or the Wuhan virus has led to some Americans blaming Chinese Americans or other people who look Asian uh, for causing the pandemic. And this has been the source of sporadic verbal and physical harassment, uh, especially in communities like Oakland or some parts of the San Gabriel Valley or other, other American cities where there is a Chinese population. But what really uh, uh, raised, uh, what really elevated the concern uh, were the shootings of the uh, Asian women in Atlanta earlier this year. That really galvanized the attention of many Asian Americans. It, it, it reinforced the sense that a lot of Asian Americans have that they're because of, of their ethnicity or the way they look, uh, uh, it, it makes them feel like they're walking around with a target on their back. And uh, that statistic about the year-to-year -year increase in anti-Asian harassment and violence in Los Angeles County just reinforces it. Now, it is sporadic. It doesn't appear to reflect uh, any kind of organized attacks, but it, it is a reminder that even after, even 150 years after the massacre in Los Angeles, that uh, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans may have some reason, a legitimate reason, to feel afraid of violence. And so that's the connection with 2021. And I think it's part of the reason why in the weeks since we have started to organize to create a permanent memorial to the massacre, there has been a very uh, uh, enthusiastic response um, down here in L.A., you can sort of feel the momentum among Asian Americans once they hear about the massacre and realize that most people are totally unaware of this history. It makes people want to do something about it. At least that, that's what happened in my case, where uh, although I read the book about it nine years ago, I didn't do anything about it until uh, I read an article, an op-ed article in the L.A. Times around March or April of this year that, that, that made the connection between the 1871 massacre and the continuing threat of violence against Asian Americans in 2021 to be a very visible and living connection. Was there ever any justice achieved from the massacre of 1871? No. The, uh, there were about eight men who were found guilty, but who were let off on technicalities. So, uh, uh, no, the justice system did not work. And finally, again, you are working on this committee to come up with uh, a memorial toward to the massacre. Um, is it where are you in the process? Are you still taking? Is there we do air in Los Angeles? Is there anything you want the people in LA to know about this? There will be a public process, and we invite members of the community, uh, not just Chinese and Asian Americans, but anybody who's interested in recognizing uh, uh, social justice and, and the lack of justice, to uh, observe and participate in the process. We anticipate that there will be a formal design competition. That is, uh, we will encourage artists and designers to come up with their best ideas, uh, which may include unconventional ideas and may include the use of technology like, like uh, audio recordings or uh, augmented reality to find ways to use uh, uh, state-of-the-art methods to tell the story of the massacre. And so we think that by early 2022, there will be a formal request for ideas that will be released. This will be an invitation for artists and, and architects and designers to respond with an idea. Uh, and, and then there will be a design jury. Uh, 
that is a jury consisting of um, trained designers, people out of the design community, as well as people from the community who will try to figure out the best ideas out there. Um, the city of Los Angeles has been quite generous allocating an initial $250,000 to support the concept of a memorial. We think that this probably will be a, a money that will be used directly to operate the design competition, but to actually build the memorial, especially if it's built across several sites, both a primary site and some of the secondary sites that I've described to you, it's probably going to take a lot of money, and we will be very active in raising money to do this. But the goal is to create a world-class memorial. In other words, something more than a plaque laid into the sidewalk, but some way of showing physically to the world this is what happened here in Los Angeles in 1871 and getting people to think about what are the lessons that people need to learn from this buried history. Michael Wu has been our guest. Michael Wu is the co-chair of a steering committee that has produced a report that came out last Friday on the recommendations of a memorial remembering the massacre that we've been in conversation about that occurred in 1871 in Los Angeles. He's also the author of an essay called After 150 Years, Is L.A. Ready to Remember the Chinese Massacre? You could read that at Zocalo publicsquare.org and he is the narrator of a new documentary film about the massacre called buried history you can find it on youtube we'll also link it to our video uh interview that we also post on youtube as well as on our website at kpfa.org if you want to see the documentary film michael Wu, that was important and and i thank you dearly for telling me this story today Thank you so much for helping us tell other people about what happened back in 1871.